Yeah, good evening to everyone. Um, yeah, the Buddha taught different ways of developing mindfulness of the body. And yeah, we can read about them in the Satipatthana Sutta, in the discourse about the four foundations of mindfulness. Um, yeah, but some of them are taught up talked about very frequently, for example, mindfulness of breathing or mindfulness of the body posture, clear comprehension, um, but some of them are not talked about that often. For example, contemplating the 32 parts of the body, contemplating the decay of the body or contemplating the four elements. And Yeah, so today I thought I'd share some of my inspiration to um, do these contemplations. And yeah, it's something maybe also interesting at least to hear sometimes about. I don't remember so many Dhamma talks by Western monks talking about contemplation of the body. And also generally, but people who meditate regularly, they have the aspiration to realize some insight, vipassana, by the meditation and contemplating the body is the path, the cause that leads to this realization, just like we chanted now. Sabe sankara anichati yadapanyaya pasati atta nibindati duke isa mango visudhya. So, seeing that sankharas are impermanent, one becomes disenchanted with dukkha, and this is the path to liberation, to the peace, like beyond birth and death. And so yeah, why it is important to yeah, contemplate the nature of the body. Um, in a way, the, you could say the purpose of Adama practice is to fully understand dukkha, and fully understanding suffering or unsatisfactoriness, and also to realize the cessation of dukkha, the cessation of suffering, realizing liberation, nibbana. And so many forms of suffering that we experience are connected with the body. And birth and sickness and aging and death. And then also maybe sometimes we feel like we are beautiful, sometimes we feel we are not so beautiful. And or we get attracted to other people to experience suffering because of that. And so yeah, by contemplating the body we can yeah, because of that it's of necessary to contemplate the, the body or important to do it. Um, so we see the body as it really is. Maybe that sounds a little bit strange that if you say if you look at your hair or at your skin, so what is the special to see? Maybe they want to develop some profound insight and thinking, okay, look at my skin and what, what is there special to see? Um, and maybe I've even studied medicine for several years and with a doctor and then so what else can you still know about the body? But yeah, that what we have to see, that we never have seen the body free from desire, aversion and delusion. We've never seen it free from eye making and mind making. And so this is what we have to practice for. And so maybe uh, some short examples to illustrate that that if you let's say for example hair that we if you look at a person that we find attractive 
then the hair of the head is of part of this perception of attractiveness that we have for that person. And then on the other hand, and so we are on the one hand attracted to hair. <coughs> on the other hand, then say we clean a bathroom or shower and then we find some hair on the ground, then it's actually nothing special or nothing particularly attractive. We rather find it maybe a little bit repulsive. That if you find some few hairs in the shower, it's actually nothing marvelous. Even if it would be even if it would be the hair of some supermodel or some famous actor, it's actually yeah, would maybe be slightly repulsive. So we are we can see we are sort of attracted and repelled by hair. And but because we are we haven't seen it as it really is. Or similar see eyes, no, eyeballs. And if we look at a person we find attractive, then the eyes are part of this perception of attractiveness and we find it the eyes of beautiful and enchanting. But then if you imagine um, that I would like, take a knife and remove the eyeball out of my socket and put it onto my hand, then, then it would be very horrifying. And so when we are attracted and repelled by eyes, for example, and this is because we haven't seen them as, as they really are. And um, so we can see that by these examples you can notice there's something strange going on about the way we perceive the body, our own body, and the body of others. But there's some sort of delusion lurking there, and because of that we are sort of attracted and repelled. <coughs> yeah, and so the, the way the Buddha describes the contemplation of the 32 parts is um, that one contemplates this body from the um, soles of the feet to the top of the head, which is covered by skin and filled with very unattractive um, parts. For example, not the external ones like hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, and then, for example, flesh and bones and so on, and different organs. And so um, the way to contemplate this, for example, with bones, you can um, you feel the body part. So for example, if you have your hands like this, you can even directly feel the bones. You can feel the hardness of the bone and you feel the hand and visualize the bones. But if you have no clear image, you can use some pictures of a skeleton was a model and model of a skeleton and um, then um, yeah you visualize the bones and feel the area or feel directly the bone and repeat the you can either repeat the word bones or ati the party word this is just a similar like buddha or counting the breath a way of directing the mind to the meditation object um, and noticing maybe when you get distracted so yeah, you can, you can, for example, if you do that in a meditation session, you can, for example, start at your hands, visualizing the bones in the hands, and then gradually moving through different areas of your body, and, um, and the skull and the ribs and so on, visualizing it and repeating bones, bones, ati, ati. And in this way, you could say, building up a mental image of the of the bones in the body, and then being aware of the whole body, having the image of the skeleton present and feeling the whole body, and keeping it in mind for a few minutes. And then also bring up the sense of interest or curiosity. That can you clearly, what does, what does this bone actually look like? Can you see it clearly in your mind? Um,
and similar with, for example, with the other body parts, the skin. You can, so once we can even see, that you can see the skin so covering the body like a membrane. You can feel different areas. You can feel the skin touching your the clothing that you're wearing. And so you can feel it, the area, visualize the skin covering the body inside, for example, outside. And also building up an image, sort of feeling different parts of the body, visualizing it and building up this image. Yeah, we can use just like the word skin and or touch or the Pali word and repeat it similar like to direct the mind to the meditation object. Yeah, the Buddha um, describes the attitudes, how to contemplate in a simile. <coughs> he says it's similar like if you if you would have a bag of uncooked rice or lentils and then you would open the bag and look inside and see this uncooked rice and lentils and you contemplate that this is rice, this is these are lentils. So it's a rather sort of neutral attitude. And I think it's important if you start that you don't so misunderstand this contemplation to um, develop disgust. Um, this is actually an unwholesome mind state. Um, of disgust is a form of aversion. That you, if you, if you direct unwise attention to something of repulsive, then you experience disgust or aversion. While the the idea of the contemplation, if you apply it correctly, is that it leads to disenchantment and part called Nibida, just like what you chanted, um, Atta Nibinda Tituke Isa Mago Visudia. So um, this disenchantment, this passion arises um, as a result if we see um, things as they really are with Samadhi, with a, with a calm and clear mind. And so it is com something completely different from disgust that we usually experience when we see something horrible. And um, but the result of this disenchantment and this passion is liberation. So we experience our, our peace and, and happiness as a result of this contemplation. So of, often, I think people, uh, so I think this, the contemplation of the body is not so popular because people think it's sort of disgusting or sort of unpleasant. But if you practice it correctly, it's actually something very uplifting and the mind becomes bright and um, peaceful. So it's different than you might imagine. Yeah, so that because of that, <coughs> my recommendation would be to start with the five external body parts, with the hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin, and the ones that you maybe can feel directly, like the flesh, the muscles and the bones, because they're not so especially disgusting, more like neutral. And so you can, if you contemplate, start by contemplating that, you can get a feeling or this disenchantment in comparison to disgust. And um, yeah, this is, I think that's a good way to, to start that. Yeah, with regards to then those of the Buddha in the Satipatthana Sutta discourse about the five, four foundations of mindfulness, it also describes the contemplation of the decay of the body. So one, um, the way that he describes it is when you bring up the image of a dead person you have seen and contemplate that this, this body is of the same nature. So 
but for that you can either use um, if you have seen maybe you've been um, at somebody's funeral um, if it was not a close relative then you can use this image for example or then for example usually you have uh, at least the image of a skeleton you know approximately what a skeleton looks like and so you can just bring up for example the image of a skeleton in front of you flying on the floor and yeah, feeling your own body sitting there upright and then using these contemplation sentences from the Satipatthana Sutta just like the Buddha describes it feeling the body contemplating this body is of the same nature this is how it will be this is how it will end and so keeping this image in mind and um, feeling the body sitting upright and um, using the sentences as contemplation so you can just for example start with a with a skeleton and then for example contemplate it a few minutes and then for example scattered bones like different bones scattered on the floor and then they gradually sort of deteriorate and turn into bone dust and then sort of that bone dust gets washed away and one can contemplate the both the body parts and the decay of the body while sitting like I'm sitting here or on a chair or while standing or also while walking so if you already have developed this contemplation you can also do it while walking meditation and yeah so the Buddha and then the Buddha says it's not a very well-known discourse but in the Sangha Nikaya it's a short discourse where the Buddha says the perception of a skeleton leads to dwelling in great peaceful peacefulness or leads to great peace and dwelling at ease and <coughs> um, yeah so if you develop based on this perception of a skeleton you can develop the seven enlightenment factors and it can yeah lead to liberation just like with mindfulness of breathing or with um, developing loving kindness metta and so for example you keep the perception of bones of a skeleton in mind and because of that you have established mindfulness of the body and so you develop the enlightenment factor of mindfulness and then investigation of the Dhamma the second enlightenment factor um, and the, of the perception of a skeleton has a powerful effect on the mind and, and if you think about it if you for example um, they imagine um, some a couple a man and a woman who have just fallen in love and they walk around in a park maybe go to some place to be alone with themselves and then they find a skeleton <laughs> and so suddenly this romantic atmosphere disappears like a dream and the reason is that if we have the perception of a skeleton present then the nature of truth becomes apparent the Satchadama and yeah, the, the, this this um, nature of truth in the sense that, that we see that the body is actually a skeleton covered with flesh and skin and sort of our usual perception of the body that we have is actually, which is actually not in line with the truth gets challenged and yeah, and so but if you if you keep this perception of, of the skeleton in mind then that is a, is a way of contemplating of in, directing the mind to impermanence um, with wise attention and so in this way one can develop this enlightenment factor of investigation of Dhamma
and then also the enlightenment factor of Virya um, energy. <coughs> you, you apply yourself to keep this image in mind and um, the, the contemplation and because of that you apply yourself, you apply energy to um, develop wholesome states, develop mindfulness and um, abandon unwholesome states uh, because if you, if you, you direct your mind to the mindfulness of the body, then because of that, also just like with any other meditation object, the mental hindrances um, can get weaker and abandoned. And so you apply this quite of effort. And then as a result, the rapture and or joy can arise and tranquility of the body. So because a usual um, identification um, with the body gets weakened and the mental hindrances get weaker, like the mind becomes uh, bright or joyful or then we can experience some tranquility or peacefulness as a result of this contemplation. It's a difference that usually we know only this of most people only know this happiness that if they, they, they experience if they see something beautiful or listen to something beautiful but there's also this other happiness if the mind um, stays with a meditation object and becomes free from the five hindrances one can yeah, develop experience this other happiness of, of, um, of joy which is secluded from sensuality and secluded from unwholesome states and so this can also yeah, if you apply this correctly, this contemplation then you will experience that yourself and then also samadhi, the, the mind gets more unified and um, the usual distraction or diversity of the mind um, becomes less because you apply yourself to the to the contemplation and then also equanimity and if we if we have this developed this contemplation then yeah the mind also can become more equanimous Yeah, so developing this contemplation over some time um, because it's your own skill and so for example the question may be what, what to contemplate more which body part or which for example which bone should I contemplate only one bone or the skeleton in the whole body and um, the answer to that is it depends on what the mind sees or how the mind responds to the contemplation. So um, you could say you could you have to use your you have to be observant and use your ingenuity. So you have to observe how are you contemplating and what is the result of your contemplation. So if you for example if you contemplate bones and skin or the decay of the body as I described, then you will notice sometimes the mind picks up some aspect more and um, or it makes a strong impression on the mind that's for example you contemplate in a certain way and you notice the mind gets brighter or becomes more peaceful or this disenchantment is stronger and then you contemplate this this aspect more and so in this way so the mind goes through different aspects we see in various as in various ways the the decaying nature and the of unsatisfactory nature and the alien nature, the non-self nature of the body and um, yeah, see the various aspects and so this is a in the practical terms I think this is an important principle to if you do this contemplation you have to notice that um, basically yeah, what, what way of contemplating what kind of images are more effective um, for developing samadhi and um, 
and disenchantment. And so this the own skill gradually after that if you contemplate that for months and, and years then you will notice some differences and how to contemplate more effectively. Um, yeah, another nice thing about this contemplation <coughs> is contemplating the body in this way. It's a um, a way you can develop um, samadhi based on vimangsa. Um, you develop samadhi based on investigation. So, for example, if you more like, if the mind is more discursive and thinking more, then, and for example, just staying with the breath is very calm and very little activity. But then, if you if you contemplate in this way, it's something more like active and you, the mind. It's more engaging for the mind, and you, yeah, by the power of the contemplation, of the mind gets drawn in and stays with the object and with the contemplation, and so this investigation leads to samadhi and the mind being more unified. So it's a little bit different than the let's say for just staying with the breath and the calmness. And so if this contemplation gets more momentum and you are of samadhi, the calm and unification of the mind gets um, is sufficient, then um, yeah, some limiters can arise from the, of the decaying nature of the body or of the um, non-self nature of the body. Um, uh, you could say a, a limiter is a a powerful perception of yeah, of the decay or unsatisfactory nature or non-self nature of the body. And it's different than a visualization. It's something that arises as a result of your contemplation. Um, and these um, limiters can be, these images or experiences can be um, either internal or external or decaying or non-decaying. So, for example, as a result of the contemplation, you just have, you actually, you actually see that your own body is just like a fresh corpse. And it's very different than just visualizing it, but you actually see it. Um, or you just, for example, you actually see the, the skeleton in the body, like internal or external. Well, for example, I think in Ajahn Chah's biography, he once describes that the body just sort of exploding into body parts. <laughs> and um, that oil, for example, you contemplate the decay of the body, and at the same time you experience that your own body disintegrates gradually and turns into dust. And um, yeah, this, this limiters have then also a strong effect on the mind in terms of that one will experience great peace and liberation because then, because it's a very powerful perception of impermanence, then also one will experience as a result some, some liberation and, and peace because of that. Yeah, the main, this, this limiters don't arise just randomly, but usually the main cause for them is the way you contemplate. So depending on the way you contemplate, then a corresponding um, limiter will arise. And um, so just as an example, say when I, um, I already started contemplating the body before I ordained, for several years and then as Samanera and then I would only contemplate usually the five external body parts and the flesh and the bones and uh, just uh, a dead body 
but I wouldn't contemplate the decay of the body. And so this was maybe for many years, maybe three, three years or so until there was a Samanera novice. I contemplate, contemplated the body like that without contemplating the decay. And I had already the feeling that somehow the contemplation is not progressing beyond a certain level. And um, and then, but then, I think when I was a novice, because Ajahn Mahabur and other Thai Ajahns, they encouraged to contemplate the decay, and I also tried to do that. And so then it made a big difference. And so, for example, if if you don't contemplate the decay of the body, then it's very unlikely that a decaying limiter will arise. And um, and yeah, a certain aspect of identification with the body will not get um, sort of challenged by the contemplation if I don't contemplate the decay. So just an, as an example. And yeah, if one contemplates the, the body in this way, then it's just natural that this um, limiters arise, so it's just something normal, and one just uses them as basis for further contemplation. Um, and also, over time, then one gets more say, skilled in the sense that um, changing the contemplation so that gradually uh, you develop an immeasurable perception of, of impermanence or immeasurable perception of non-self. So first, maybe you have just some limiters of some body part or some of the decay of the body, and then gradually changing the contemplation, adapting it, so that this perception of impermanence gets more and more like, limitless. And because of that, the mind will rise above the world and yeah, experience the peace of liberation. Um, And so this, <coughs> the contemplation of the decay of the body can say, branch out in three different areas. Uh, um, um, contemplating the decay of the body, um, the, the decay of the body parts. Um, that if you contemplate say, the decay of a dead body, it can become apparent that, that the, this dead body is made up of the same body parts like your own body and the way the contemplation is described in the Satipatthana Sutta is actually actually specifically designed to the dead bodies are described in terms of the body parts that they contemplate so the, the contemplation is made so that it sort of fits together and um, goes together then the contemplation of, <coughs> of food it's also something that can become apparent, this quality, that actually our bodies are just food. And there are different aspects to it. Um, but for example, usually if, let's say if me, people meet a tiger, then they are very afraid because then also the, the nature of truth becomes apparent. There's such a dhamma um, that our body is actually just a lump of food. <laughs> and um, so the usual perception of that we have this feeling, this is, I'm this, about the body, and then certainly you get confronted with this reality that actually your body is just food for another creature. Um, but then all these body parts, the bones and the flesh and all the other body parts, they're actually just foods that you ate and then got transformed into body parts. And so, in this way, the, the body in pr the present is, is food, and then also after the end of the life, it will be eaten by creatures. And also, not all the, the experience of the five senses arises based on 
on food, that the, the eye, the ear, all the sense organs of the, of the body, the five senses, they all arise dependent on food. And whatever you experience based on these five senses arises based on food. So also this contemplation can lead quite far. And then the third one is the contemplation of the four elements, the four datus. The, this is in a way the most <coughs> subtle contemplation of the body, um, the, the four elements. Yeah, it appears in different sets, so that the Buddha often instructs us to look at our experience in terms of the five khandhas, the five aggregates. And the first one is the rupa khandha, the form aggregate. And so this form, material form, is usually described as these four elements. And they are usually translated as the earth, water, fire, and air, which maybe is a little bit abstract if you hear it like this. Um, what kind of earth is maybe, the kind of, okay, how can I notice the earth in the body or the water? Um, but yeah, it's actually something practical. This, um, these four elements are aspects of your experience of the body. And I could also translate the word element as property. So a certain property of form, a certain aspect of form. And <coughs> Yeah, so for example, the earth element, the way the Buddha describes it, it's something that you can experience directly. It's the solid and hard quality of the body. So, and if you example, for example, if you touch your teeth with your tongue, you can feel the hardness of the teeth. And this is the quality of the earth element. Or if you touch your nails, you can notice the hardness of your nails, and this would be the earth element. Or if you have your hands like this, you can you feel your bones, and you can feel the hardness, and this is the earth element. And in this body parts, it's most clearly the most have the strongest of earth element quality. While, for example, the flesh is a little bit softer, has less earth element. So that is quite of hardness or softness of different body parts and external objects. So that you can feel on the one hand the hardness or softness of your own body on the cushion, for example. And then the cushion itself as well has a certain quality of hardness or softness. And this is the earth element. And so for example, in meditation, you can similar and feel different parts of your body, areas of the body. Can you notice this quality of softness or hardness in the body? Feeling it directly, so it's like a direct experience. So first going through different areas and then feeling the whole body and feeling this quality of the earth element. And then similar, repeating earth, earth or patavi, the Pali word, direct the minds to this quality of the earth element. The, the fire element is, a, is not so difficult. It's the quality of warmth or coolness. So, for example, if I feel my body now, for example, the fingers feel quite cool or cold, and this area feels more warm, for example. And so I can feel the different areas um, of the body and notice this quality of warmth or coolness. So 
then the air element is the quality of movement or um, the pressure exerted by movement. So for example, if you feel, you can feel the movement of your breath. So if it's just like a, a shape, sort of expanding and contracting in space. This quality of movement is the earth element or the, the air, for example. And then you know, the, the water element is something more subtle. Um, some aspects of it are more obvious. So for example, the saliva or the tears or the blood or urine and so on in the body would be the, the water element. But then the water element is also this quality of cohesion or binding things together. Um, so, for example, the, say the, the solid parts of the body, that if they, for example, if the body dries up, then a lot of the solid parts crumble to dust. And so it also has this quality of binding the solid parts, ho holding it together. And so this, yeah, this contemplation of the, of the elements is a little bit more difficult than the body parts and the decay of the body. Because the four elements, they're more different than, very quite different to the way we usually look at our body and the body of others. And the body parts is still quite close to how we perceive the body. But um, usually we don't look at our body in terms of, of this quality of hardness or warmth and so on so much. So it's a different way of looking at the body, which yeah, so I would recommend first to just contemplate the body parts and the decay of the body and then maybe after some time, maybe one year, two years, contemplate, trying to contemplate the, you can contemplate the individual body parts as earth elements or the, the water elements, the aspect of cohesion. And um, there's also a possibility Yeah, it's very important. It's an important meditation um, the theme. For example, in the first discourse of the Majjhimadikaya, the Buddha says the difference between an ordinary person, a noble disciple, and an arahant is how you perceive and how you relate to these four elements. And so, yeah, that's how far this, how we relate to these four elements makes a difference whether we are an ar arahant or an ordinary person. So it's like a, one can see the difference in terms of, um, yeah, that this, obviously and this, um, that this contemplation is important or can lead very far. And so we would say the, it's like different modules the body parts and the decay of the body and then based on that the contemplates the four elements. And so if you have already experienced with the certain two parts and the decay of the body, then um, yeah, the, this contemplation can be taken one step further. Also relating that what I said about the limiters, that's um, there's one nice um, little verse by a senior monk in the Theragata. The, there are these verses of senior monks in the Sutta Pitaka, <coughs> and this I don't even know his name. He's uh, not so well known. I think it's Theragata verse 17 or 18. He just left a very short verse where he describes. Um, He's dwelling in the forest and pervading the entire earth with the perception of bones. And so how do you pervade the entire earth with the perception of bones? So nice. It is something that captured my interest, this 
Terragata-Börse. And so if you have already experienced with, with the contemplation of the bones and the body parts, then you contemplate the individual body parts, the earth element, the hardness, and um, contemplate the parts individually, and then together they're all the earth element. So the bones and the flesh and so on, they all have this quality of earth element. And the same, the internal and external, the Buddha says that the internal, the earth element can be internal and external, and both the internal and the external earth element, it's just the earth element. And so, um, the feeling the earth elements of external objects have this quality of earth element and the body. And yeah, so expanding this perception of the earth elements, internal and external, and developing, developing the contemplation like that. And it's also something the Buddha describes in different discourses. Kamaji Manikaya 121, and yeah, for example, he says the a monk goes in seclusion and then he develops this perception of the earth element. And he doesn't attend to the perception of people or the forest, but develops this perception of the earth element, internal and external, and that whatever material objects there are, they are the earth element. It's very interesting we have this capability to do that. This is a basic um, quality of, of sanya, of perception. Often this perception is used for like, unwholesome purposes, like for example, I mean, a perception, maybe just in general, is this quality of, of recognizing similarity. So for example, the brown of my robe and the brown of the shrine is both a brown color. And even though they're slightly different, you can notice that it's both brown. Or, for example, if I look at the people here, then I can, they all look slightly different. But I can all recognize them as human beings, or as like a male or female, even though they look different. So this quality of Sanya of recognizes similarities or for example food that's one of the earliest perception that gets established this little baby you, you put your, some things into your mouth some try out to chew it and then some some things you can eat you know this and sometimes you, some things you can't eat and so um, gradually this perception this is food and this is not food gets established and so we can for example, we can recognize, let's say, a banana and chocolate. We can very easily recognize them as food. And this perception gives rise to then a desire, for example. And even though a banana and a chocolate look completely different, we can recognize that's food and it's very immediate. And so similar, even though, let's say, this clock and my body is very different, it has still a similarity of the earth element. And so one can develop this perception, um, use this power of perception in this way to uh, develop one powerful perception of impermanence and non-self, um, which leads to liberation. And so the contemplation of the body has various um, benefits. For example, not for abandoning fear. The, some of them, two of the main root causes for fear are our identification with the body. But if we, if we identify with our body, the more we will I feel fear when some of you are threatened. Well, if, our, if we identify less with our body, then there will be obviously less fear. And 
then also, for example, if you have some serious illness, usually um, if we are, for example, if we have some chronic disease or have a very serious illness, then usually we, we the tendency of the mind is to direct unwise attention to it and we get like unhappy or dejected or depressed because um, we notice we can't use our body anymore as usual. <coughs> and if we have experience with the contemplation of the body, then we can instead direct wise attention to the decay of the body. And instead of the mind being down, the mind gets actually liberated by the contemplation. So if, if you have already some skill in it and your, your health gets worse, then it can be very, very um, useful to use this contemplation in a very direct way to experience some peace. And, um, Yeah, another gradually over years if we contemplate the body, we practice that. The first we just um, remove distorted perceptions which cause attraction and aversion. Well, but then um, because of the contemplation we also can, can get in, uh, develop insight how these perceptions of attractiveness and unattractiveness arise. Because they don't come from external things, they don't come from things outside of us, but they actually come, they're created by our own mind. And so, if we, if we contemplate that and sufficiently, then we can also get some insight into that, how this process, that there's this process in the mind going on which creates these perceptions of attractiveness and unattractiveness. And um, they actually separate from the material objects. And so, by the contemplation, this, this process can be abandoned and dismantled. And as a result, we will be less and less be affected by a sense experience. And we experience a peace that is not disturbed anymore, whatever we see or hear or whatever happens to our body, there will be this, uh, this profound peace in our heart as a result. Also, we can by the contemplation of the body, we can understand love, so to speak. If you contemplate the body, that if you if you want to understand love, then there's no need to start many exciting relationships or read lots of love poems. But if you contemplate the thirty-two parts of the body, the decay of the body, the four elements, then you will understand, yeah, love and how this sense of attraction arises, how it comes to be. It's another benefit of the um, of the contemplation of the body. Yeah, and uh, also insight can arise about that the mind and the body are actually something separate. And if we if you practice this contemplation as a result of the, the yeah. No, the, the less we the deeper insight into the decaying nature of the body, the more the, the mind will experience liberation and um, it will and they become of radiant or luminous so and experience the, the mind as something separate from the body. Also, 
or something luminous which translate um, transcends the sense realm. And so the mind gets this brightness or radiance and experiencing as something separate from the body. Yeah, so these are a few instructions and yeah, I think if you have never contemplated it, you can just try it out sometimes for half an hour and if you live on eight precepts or a monk, then I think it's recommendable to at least practice contemplation of the body half an hour a day or more and um, it's just as part of your meditation practice, like I myself, I practice mindfulness of breathing and also developing loving kindness, metta, sympathetic joy, mudita, but then also we are contemplating the body parts and the decay of the body, so developing this different, this, doing this different ways of developing the mind. Yeah, this contemplation is just yeah, can just lead to what we chanted at the beginning. Uh, it's to the path to this is the path to purity, the path to liberation. That's uh, this these body parts. They all have the same nature: uh, the hair of the head, the skin, the bones, the flesh. They all have the same nature. They are the manifestation of decay and death. And the more clearly one sees this with wisdom, the mind will experience a peace beyond death and decay. And yeah, this is what the contemplation of the body can lead to. <laughs> 